Sorry, I had to close the door so nobody hears this science going on. Um, so our example number 26.4, we want to find the electric field of a ring of charge, right? We want to set this up so we can figure out uh, how much electric field is produced by a ring of charge. So taking our problem solving process, right, our problem solving steps, uh, first step is to create a axis system. Um, this one's a little bit more complex than any of the other ones that we've used so far because we're going to be working in three dimensions, right? We have a Y, an X, and a Z. All right, and hopefully I'm doing an okay job drawing in three dimensions. Uh, if not, sorry. All right, so um, we put a coordinate as a system on there. Second step is to pick a point P where we're gonna talk about the field. So uh, I'll pick a point P right here. That's where we wanna figure out what the strength of the electric field is. Um, and then from there, uh, we're gonna divide the total charge into pieces, right? So I will take a piece of this circle here. I'm gonna pick the top. That's going to be my delta Q. All right, and we'll see where that little piece of field creates, or a little piece of charge creates a field at point P. So if we work down this way, that's not even close. That's a little bit better. All right, there is my electric field. Um, they like calling the sections I, so I'll call this uh, segment I, and this could be EI. All right, um, we also want to look to see if there's any other ways that we can simplify, right? So if we look at the electric field from some other point on the circle, right, namely down here, the exact opposite, and we look at the way it creates a field at P. Now, I know that these don't look like exact opposites because we're working in three dimensions right now. It's kind of hard to see. But here, uh, we should notice that the Y component is getting canceled, right? Uh, this charge is applying a force that is in the positive Z direction, positive Y direction. This one's exerting an electric field or creating electric field. I think I just said force, but creating electric field in the negative Y, positive Z. So positive Y, positive Z, negative Y, positive Z, the positive and negative Y will cancel, which means our Y components cancel. Um, we could check a couple other spots, right? Maybe the x-axis here and the x-axis here. And if we compare the electric field created by those, uh, we should see that the x-axis cancels uh, where the z-axis um, adds on. So uh, based on that, we know that this problem is going to simplify to just the z components of our electric fields, right? The x components and y components are going to cancel out because all around the circle they have um, an opposite, a symmetrical opposite uh, that will cancel them out. So we're going to be focusing on a point charge here that's going to create an electric field, and we're going to focus on the Z component of that electric field. So uh, we are going to have E, I in the Z direction, which if we pretend it's a point particle or a point charge, 1 over 4 pi epsilon Q over, we got to pick a distance here. So we'll call this distance R1 or RI, right? Because our uh, segment is called I. So we'll call that bar I squared. And then we want to pick out the Z component. If we look here, we draw our angle in theta, the Z component is going to be a cosine. So cosine of theta I, we'll call that. Um, and that's okay, but we need to rewrite this because we want it in terms of uh, variables that are on the X and Y axis or Z axis, right? Something that's along the axis, right? We don't want these variables that are um, going at diagonals. They're not easy to work with, particularly if we have to integrate. So um, theta doesn't do a whole lot for us and our I doesn't do a whole lot for us. 
So we're gonna try to turn these into other things, namely this distance right here, which we'll call Z, right? The distance to P, the distance along the Z axis to P, and this distance R, which is just gonna be the radius of our circle, right? R is the radius of our circle. So we, we can rewrite these things um, in terms of Z and R, that would be really beneficial for us. So one over four pi epsilon, delta Q over Ri squared, well, uh, Ri is the hypotenuse of this triangle, so z squared plus r squared is going to equal Ri squared. So we've got z squared plus r squared, capital R, because it's a radius. It's a constant, it's a radius. Um, cosine, if we look at cosine, um, this is the angle. That doesn't tell us a whole lot, but if we opposite angle theorem or whatever you want to call that, right, we can look at this. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so Z over Ri. So we'll have Z over Ri. But again, Ri doesn't do a whole lot for us, so we'll replace that with what Ri equals, which is the square root of Z squared plus R squared. Right? And there is our equation represented by things that are on the X, Y, or Z axis, which are nicer to work with. Um, these we can combine, uh, and we end up with 1 over 4 pi epsilon, uh, z times delta q over uh, z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves power. Uh, 1 half times, well, yeah. Okay, so um, that's good. That's all well and fine, but that gives us a single EIZ, right? Just gives us the one. But we want all of the EIZs, right, for all of the um, different segments of our circle here. So we're going to take a summation. The sum from I equals 1 to N of the EIZs, which is going to equal... 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times the summation i equals 1 to n. Oh, it's a capital N. I don't know why I write so high on the board and do this to myself. I do it every time. Like, just learn. Z delta Q over z squared plus r squared to the three halves power. Okay, so there's my summation. Now, um, in a summation, right, we can bring out everything that's a constant, all right? Constants are gonna stay the same. They won't have an impact on the, uh, on the summation, which is why the four pi epsilon is out front already. But if we look at this, right, the z is a constant because that's just the distance along the z axis to p. Uh, the r is a constant because that's the radius of our circle. Um, so we can pull out this whole thing and the z on top. So we'll end up with 1 over 4 pi epsilon. Um, we're going to pull out the z over z squared plus r squared uh, to the 3 halves. And all that's going to be left in our summation is the sum from i equals 1 to n of delta q. And if we think about this, right, what is the sum of all the individual increments of delta q, right, which we are splitting our circle into? Well, if we take the sum of all the delta q pieces, we just end up with the total charge, which is q. So we, we get lucky with this one because it's not um, some, there's not anything that we have to integrate. There's so many constants, there's nothing that's variable, uh, that the only thing we're left with uh, inside the summation is the change in Q. We, if we add all the delta Qs together, right, all the small increments of Q, we end up with the total charge, which is Q. So we get 1 over 4 pi epsilon uh, Z. Q over 
z squared plus r squared to the three halves power. And there is the electric field for a ring. One over four pi epsilon uh, z times q over z squared plus r squared to the three halves. Double check, see if I got it right. Because you know I mess up sometimes, I'm not perfect. Nailed it. All right, cool. Um, we could check the, the limits just to make sure it makes sense. Um, if we move infinitely far away where Z is much greater than R, uh, we should end up with a point charge like we do with almost everything that we move infinitely far away from. So uh, if we look at this, if we make Z much larger than R, Z becomes more important. The R disappears. Z squared to the three halves would just be Z cubed. Uh, so we get a z on the top, a z cubed on the bottom, which just gives us z squared. And we end up with 1 over 4 pi epsilon q over z squared, which is what we expect. That's the equation for a point charge. And if we look at the case where uh, z becomes very small, right, and we approach the center of the circle, um, center of the circle or center of the ring, the electric field should be zero because everything's canceling. So as z approaches zero, we should see that our electric field goes to zero. And because we have a z in the numerator right here, as that goes to zero, this whole thing is going to become zero. Zero times zero is also zero. Uh, so we end up with what we expect as far as the limits go when z is very much bigger than r or z is very much smaller than r. Um, so those two make sense. I was about to ask if there was any questions, but nobody's here. It's, it's just me. So I'm not taking questions. No questions allowed.